Let's have a little look at the individual episodes of Fallout and try to explain why I have a bit of an issue with how the plot unfolded. I don't think anyone can complain about the sets, props, locations. They were all done to a very high standard. The problems arise from the mechanics of the world and how they interact with one another. So warning, this is going to be full on spoilers. While discussing episode 1 of Fallout, I'm going to be talking about issues with how it relates to episode 8 of Fallout. There will be massive spoilers, so this is only for people who have seen the Fallout TV show and want to discuss it in detail. So last warning, I am about to spoil the entire plot of Fallout Season 1. We'll work our way through chronologically and any time we see a scene with an issue, we'll compare it to later episodes or perhaps even real life examples. You have been warned, so let's get into it. Spoilers! Okay, the first thing we get is orange coloured sky by Nat King Cole. That's fine, but I think somehow in this show, there are too many musical callbacks to the games. Sometimes there will be three songs in five minutes. Other times there will be snippets of the same song played three or four times in a single episode. Some episodes have what felt like 15 songs played during their runtime. If a song is in the world, like Maximus listening to a record in Vault 4, I'm not going to count it, but let's keep a running tally. This is particularly annoying for those of us who like to watch with subtitles. I like to watch with subtitles because I'm not sure if I'm going death through old age or it's industrial deafness from going to too many gigs, but modern shows seem to put the dialogue too far down in the mix. And it's an issue with modern shows because I can still watch old shows without subtitles. Take for example, I recently watched the 1980 version of Shogun after watching the magnificent 2024 version. Link to my review playlist here. I did not need subtitles at all and the actress in the 1980s Shogun didn't even speak English. She was learning her lines phonetically. Anyway, if you have subtitles on, it puts the lyrics on the screen and they intersperse the lyrics with the dialogue. So it's very crowded and rushes the subtitles. So more songs equals more annoyance for subtitle users. Maybe that's just a me issue. So that's one song this episode. The only real hint that this isn't the 1950s is the Mr. Handy in the kitchen but it's so hidden behind glare-filled glass that there's every chance you'll miss it. How does that work for people who are not familiar with the games? Maybe another hint is the skyline. It's very unusual and sort of retro-futuristic, but I know what's going on, so I won't hold it against them. So Cooper Howard, any relation to Todd, is doing birthday parties to pay for his alimony? What alimony? He appears to have custody of his daughter, his wife is a vault tech executive. She was getting him roles in their advertisements. So I'm assuming that his career is at a dead end. If his career wasn't at a dead end, he wouldn't be doing birthday parties. He would be doing movies. So did they divorce because he found out about vault techs plan to blow up the world? Or was it because he wouldn't give up his dog to go into the vault? But he's fine with dear old Sugarfoot here getting nuked? If vault dropping the nukes, why is one of the top-level execs daughters still out in the open on D-Day? Shouldn't her mother have arranged for her to be in the vault? She was arranging for her husband to be in the vault. Or once they got divorced, did she decide her daughter was no longer entering the vault and can die like the rest of humanity? We're less than two minutes in and we've already encountered massive plot holes. This is not good writing. Is the excuse, well, she's just evil. This is a minor gripe, but why won't he do the thumbs up? Because it represents vault whom he knows is going to drop the nukes? Or is it because he doesn't want to bring up the thought of nuclear bombs at some kid's birthday? Because I doubt the kids are going to know. The dads call him a pinko, so somehow it's gotten out that he's involved with the communist slash Moldova. Why would they hire him if they think he's a commie? His daughter asks him if he thinks the bomb is going to be dropped. Now, you could say he's lying to her so that she won't be afraid, but he does know the bombs are going to be dropped. So that just reinforces what a bad parent he is. He should be seeking shelter. He probably should have kept his mouth shut and went into the vault. Either that or shouted from the rooftops what vault Tech's plans are. He should be a whistleblower or in the vaults. No other option makes sense. 
Let's not talk about how weird it is to ask for a slice of cake for your kid from the party you're working at. Maybe just offer to get ice cream on the way home? Okay, so I was wondering when I first watched this why nobody inside the glass-walled house noticed the nuclear flash going off outside. But apparently the flash from a camera is the equivalent brightness. I mean, Wikipedia says looking at the flash can blind you for up to 40 minutes. This kid is unaffected. The blast also makes no noise. Oh, that's just stylistic slow-mo sans audio. The people inside should hear it still. Cooper is oblivious even as he exits the building, facing the blast. We've got the world's slowest moving mushroom cloud here. All of the other detonations feature immediately obvious mushroomicity. Song number two, Perry Como, Don't Let the Stars Get In Your Eyes. 219 years later from some undefined date. Seems like the nukes dropped 2077, so 2296? Lucy McLean is a resident of Vault 33. The blackboard says that the bombs dropped in 2077. Something happened in 1969. I'm sure it was nice. Is that almost the Enclave flag just with one large star in the centre of the circle instead of an E? Anyone else bothered by the fact that the blackboard doesn't have the full alphabet? Can someone tell me why the letters C, F, J and L are underlined? Lucy is shown teaching history, performing gymnastics, fencing, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, tapping out full-grown men, and riflery. They're trading with Vault 32 every three years. But it's shown that people have been long dead in that vault. What happened to all the other trades? Were they called off? Why don't they trade with Vault 31? They're in a threesome. That's where her dad comes from. Do they trade with Vault 31 on the other two years? There's at least 727 residences. Surely you don't run out of possible breeding partners after you're down to the last 700 families. At two kids per family, that's 1,400 possible partners. From what I can find, when we colonize space, we'll be aiming for around 160 people, so they should have no issues. I'm assuming she lost her virginity at 18 because she says she's been shagging her cousin for 10 years. So she's 28. Isn't that a bit late if you're running some kind of arranged marriage breeding program? As soon as I saw the white male as the overseer, I knew this had to be a dodgy vault. How right I was. Of course, that was just a fluke because the black female overseer from Deadpool is also a vault tech exec. Just Hank is even more dodgy. Why do the trade on the day of the wedding? Why not trade half your people and then just let them find each other naturally? What if Vault 32 has developed some sort of different ideology? If they have to apply to get married, would they allow them to shag their cousins? Would they allow them to shag anybody? Why hasn't Norm been set up with someone? He's got to be 24. Hell, he looks older than Lucy. And why are there different races in the Vault? By that I mean it's been 190 years. Shouldn't they be interbred? Or are the overseers instituting strict policies of marriage along racial lines? Lucy's clearly not racist as she offers to have sex with Maximus. In fact, as far as I can tell, there's no racism anywhere at any time in this universe. So why are there still black and white people? Maybe my biology is a bit rusty. Do we see any couples besides Lucy and Stephanie? Why is Moldava using her real name? Isn't she a known enemy of vault -Tec? Her existence raises so many questions that I'm not sure I'm going to be able to recall them all. The first thing was when I saw her, she's clearly some kind of Latina, or at least I would classify her as a person of colour. So combined with being a woman, there's no way she's a baddie. She's obviously doing bad things to achieve a good goal. The crook with the heart of gold. Or she's just misunderstood. It's 2024. It was never going to be anything else. Apparently she has Hank's wife's Pip-Boy on. Where'd they get the vault suits? Doesn't Hank know Moldava is the leader of the NCR? Didn't he nuke Shady Sands after his wife left to join them? How do they not know who the overseer of Vault 32 is? Wouldn't they have safeguards? 
Like if someone isn't on the invite list, they raise an alarm. Because I'm pretty sure the surnames in a vault will be set in stone. It's not like it's Smith or something in common. Overseer Jackson is dead. So does Vault 32 not have the same, when things look glum, Vote 31 saying that Vault 33 has? Shouldn't the system only accept Vault 31 alumni as the replacement overseer? All Moldaver wants is to kidnap Hank. Why go through with this whole ruse? Did she wait two years for the three years to be up for the triennial trade? Did they just happen to show up at the right time? They obviously pre-arranged to get the seed and the machine parts. I mean, just look at the Vault 32 residents. Tattoos, scars, non-1950s haircuts. There's another song here, but it's on the jukebox, so I won't count it. Are these Vault 32 residents supposed to be NCR members or just randoms hired by Moldava? There's another song, but I'm still not counting it. How do you get that jumpsuit off without taking his boots off first? And is it weird that the bride gets a hand-me-down wedding dress, but the groom doesn't show up in a moth-eaten old tuxedo? Song number four, Scatman Carruthers, Keep That Coffee Hot. So Moldova does nothing to stop Lucy Shag in this raider. She claims to have Lucy's best interests at heart, but lets her go off in private with a wild stabbing machine. So her plan to get the code for the cold fusion of Hank was to allow his daughter to be sexually assaulted. I mean, this is sex through deception. Did she not give this guy instructions to avoid stabbing Lucy? They could have just made the story about, we need to trade seed after the wheat blight. Maybe she sees him while they're hauling the parts back to Vault 32 and he could have had the same story without the sham marriage. Maybe Lucy avoids getting graped and stabbed by Moldaver's gang. Wouldn't Lucy notice issues with the cleanliness, body odour, bad breath? Wait, it says music continues in the distance and it's fainter. Is this in-world music? Why didn't they close the door behind them if there's a blight? I'd be getting the people sterilised before entering. Song number five, Carl Kokomo, A Nervous Kiss. Extra points for wiping his willy on the curtains. Norm discovers a dead body. It's black. This occurs 10 to 20 days after death. So Moldaver and her gang were just chilling with them for two weeks. The vault has facilities for corpse disposal. Okay, surely a pit boy will alert you if the local rads are above 600, if 600 is the danger zone. In game, it alerts you at any level, even lower than one. As soon as that knife went in on episode 1, I knew that there were going to be zero consequences for injuries. So the show has now established that, like the games, Stimpak pretty much instantaneously cures any wound. Also, every vault dwelling has at least one in the med kit. This old fella being held up by a machete, but he's up against a steel wall. Or at least concrete. The machete wouldn't hold you up. Lucy grabs the non-lethal option, because she's a nice girl. Another song, but again it's on the jukebox so it doesn't count. Why are the raiders attacking when everyone is awake? Why not wait until people start dispersing? Of course Fatty wants the desserts to be looked after. Honestly, who gives a damn about jelly? These raiders are useless. They'll walk straight past one guy to attack another one that is further away. Norm's under a table, but he was in Vault 32. All of the attacks on named characters are delayed. They're inhaling jet, they're shifting their grip on the knife, they're wanting to choke them out slowly. Meanwhile, unnamed characters get raped with an SMG. Into Vault Door Breach. But Norm wandered freely into Vault 32. What was the point of the choice they gave Hank, Lucy or the rest of the vault? They didn't even blow them up. They let them run back into Vault 33. Song number six, Johnny Cash, So Doggone Lonesome. Maximus is getting his butt whooped, and they actually put Thaddeus in the scene. Well done. The Brotherhood is meant to be militaristic. Wouldn't they consider the beating of another initiate to be destruction of Brotherhood property? We've sunk resources into this boy, and you're damaging that investment. Oh, they're not initiates, they're aspirants. Maximus in the fridge, flashback count, one. 
Considering all of the signs saying mechanics and pilots only, they seem to get away with entering the garage. Maybe it's an old sign from the days it was used as an airport, but they seem to act guilty when caught. Song number seven, Johnny Cash all over again. These guys are playing basket brick. If Fallout 4 has taught me anything, it's that basketballs are everywhere. This guy in the front is having a wank under the covers. If they're that open about sex, then why is Maximus so awkward about it in later scenes? Surely the Brotherhood would have some sort of rules about sexual conduct. Even if just to stop the spread of disease. I mean, there's a terminal entry on the Pridwin about someone having a disease you can only get from shagging ghouls. Dane gets promoted to Squire, and there's absolutely no indication that they have any apprehension. They seem to be pretty happy. Not at all congruent with what happens later with the razor blade in the boot. This part is bloody stupid. Dane sticks their foot in the boot and screams. At first I thought they had trench foot and removing their boot pulled all the skin off. But it's a razor blade that is in a position where it would move before cutting you. Maximus is the first to respond and he hands the boot to the boss man. If you were guilty of sabotaging their boot, you wouldn't hand it straight over. They put a bag over his head like they don't want him to know where he's going. He's been here before you idiots. Song number 8, Connie Conway, Bright Aside. That was a vertical stab, so why is Lucy stapling a horizontal wound? Would it be a bad idea to put a vault that close to the ocean? What would all the sea air do to the mechanisms of the door? And then there's erosion. You could have the ocean enter your vault when you open the door. Maximus in the fridge flashback count two. Why is there a milk bottles sign inside the door? You would see the milk bottles when you open the fridge. They call him Aspirant Dane, even though he's a squire. If that makes sense, then they'll continue to call Maximus Aspirant when he's performing the duties of a squire. Wouldn't it be a bit mean to tell someone's superiors in the Brotherhood of Steel that you wouldn't hurt a fly? The subtitles keep trying to describe the music. At the end of the scene in the infirmary it said, Suspenseful music. Sometimes these can be a bit off, but I don't know if the subs are made by the same production company, so I'll let it slide. I just think it's amusing. That would not brand a letter T. That would just be a massive blob. Why have a picture of the dog? That's just dumb pandering. Why'd Maximus get promoted to Squire before Thaddeus if Thaddeus was there before Maximus? Why have the Squire carry the weapon? The knight should be armed and they could carry that effortlessly. What's the point of killing this guy? Is he guarding the cemetery? Who is Don Pedro? What pieces do they cut off the ghoul? Does he regenerate them? Is Don Pedro a ghoul too? Because the ghoul cuts pieces off the ghoul he kills. That yeah 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 chanting brings back bad memories of the Mandalorian horn call. So they're all after the dude from the Enclave and the dog. Gotta have a drawing of the dog. And these guys in Mexico or wherever know who Moldava is. They call her the witch. And somehow they know that the ghoul has a relationship already established with Moldava. Are they working for the Brotherhood or the Enclave? Or some fourth party? Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's basically all I have to say on episode one of Fallout. It was all right. I give it a seven out of 10. Like I said, it looks great. The issue arises because it all seems above board at first glance. But if you put any thought into it, the cracks start to appear. And when you combine that with the events from later in the series, very little of it makes any sense. We ended up with eight songs on this episode, not including at least three that were in the world or in the credits. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, please consider subscribing. I release reviews occasionally when time allows, and a thumbs up would be a big motivator for further reviews. If you didn't like it, feel free to leave a thumbs down and let me know how I can improve in the comments below. Anyway, I'm Mixie. Thanks for your time, and have a good one.